Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I'm delighted to see all of you here for the gallery talk on Arthur Fuller Davis. Um, my name is Wanda Null. I was the library director um, previously and did a lot of work on collecting information about Arthur Davis. This afternoon is very special because we are pleased to introduce the Nylander Collection of Works by Arthur Davis. In 2017, Richard Nylander gave the library a large portfolio of unframed Davis works and art-related items in honor of his parents, Barbara and Donald Nylander. This collection was found in Davis's home after he moved into Chickering's nursing home in South Acton in the early 1950s. The collection included many etchings, some pen and ink drawings, some pencil drawings, a watercolor, and other ephemera from his long and productive life. None of the items were framed, all needed cleaning, and many needed restoration. Larry Powers, owner of Powers Gallery, evaluated the individual pieces in the collection and identified the items that could be successfully restored. The library applied for and received a community preservation grant to clean, restore, and frame works the library did not already own. The Acton Memorial Library Foundation also contributed to the cost of restoring and preserving these items. And this exhibit is a result of this effort. One of the etchings on the, on the wall to my right, the fourth one actually, is of a building currently in use in Acton. It houses the Rapscallions restaurant at the corner of Great Road and Strawberry Hill. When Arthur sketched it, the building was on a small farm and was owned by Silas Conant. The smaller pieces of ephemera by Arthur Davis from his, this collection are exhibited in the freestanding exhibit case to your right. They are included because these small items he had kept for many years and were important to him. Um, in this small collection of just unrelated items, we made a discovery that Arthur Davis had contributed at least two drawings to a book illustrating Boston commercial buildings. The images are in the case and they're very small but elegant. The title of the book they came from is unknown, but his trademark signature can be found in the pavement of each of the etchings. The map hanging be on the, above the case was drawn by Arthur Davis when, in 1871 when he was eight years old. The detail is amazing. And it's really interesting because the Hawaiian Islands are labeled with their original name of the Sandwich Islands. The etchings and other works in this gift add significantly to the library's collection of Davis works, hanging on the upper level of the library and in the original building. Due to COVID, the original library building is closed to the public right now, but the paintings and etchings hanging there may be viewed online under the Davis Gallery at the Acton Memorial Library website. The Acton Historical Society also has, owns a collection of Davis works and they hang in the Jinx Library and the Hosmer House. A little history about Arthur. Arthur Davis was born at 1 Tremont Street in Roxbury in 1863. He was the only surviving child of John and Martha Davis. His father, John Davis, was born in Boston. His mother was from a prominent family in Anasquam. And that's why in the etchings, there are a couple of uh, pic um, depictions of boats on the Anasquam River. He spent his summers, or not all of his summers, but each summer rather, he visited his mother's family and he 
sketched, of course, because he sketched every day. When Arthur was 12, his family moved to a small farm in Acton. They lived at 491 Main Street, almost directly across from the library. Arthur attended the Acton Center School and graduated from Acton's high school. Why his family moved to Acton is not known. In the census reports of the late 1880s, his father's occupation is given as finisher. He may have worked at the Miriam Piano Stool Company in South Acton, which manufactured and of course finished piano stools. Most of what we know about Davis's early life comes from his journals and his sketchbooks. He was a great admirer of Thoreau and took great care describing what he saw on his daily walks, sometimes accompanied by his father. There are two of his journals that survive and both have been transcribed. The 1881 is owned by the library and the other 1884 to 1886 is owned by the Historical Society. Arthur was interested in drawing from an early age, and his interest was encouraged by his parents, which was unusual for the time. Two of his very earliest works are often referred to as the barn doors, and they are currently owned by the Historical Society. These are colored drawings of cows painted on wooden stall doors from the family barn. Davis' interest in sketching and painting may have been influenced by his father. In the 1850 census, John Davis, um, Arthur's father, is living in Roxbury in a rooming house, and his occupation is listed as painter. And in the Nylander collection of items, there is a certificate issued to John Davis documenting his contribution to the establishment of the Museum of Fine Arts in 1871. In 1883, Arthur worked in Boston at the office of C.F. Hovey, which was an early department store. Later, he worked with a cousin in Malden and studied painting with Albion Bicknell. Albion Bicknell specialized in historic paintings and he taught his students to seek out eyewitness accounts to make them more accurate. Arthur, used, Arthur Davis used this technique when he painted the departure of the Davis Guard, which is hanging upstairs in the library, showing the local men responding to Lincoln's call for troops to come to Washington in 1861. Davis interviewed townspeople and in some cases their descendants who assembled in front of town, town hall early that April morning. In the late 1880s, Albion Bicknell taught a summer session on an abandoned chicken farm in Woburn, and Davis attended. In the case, there is a very small sketch of the chicken farm. There, he learned how to render drawings into etchings. The process involves coating metal plates, often copper, with a paraffin mixture and transferring an image in reverse onto the plate by cutting through the paraffin. The finished etching is then mounted into a press, the plate inked, and the paper pressed to transfer the image. During these summer sessions, studying with Bicknell, Arthur Davis met Frank Bicknell, a nephew of, of um, Albion Bicknell. In the early 1890s, Davis and Frank Bicknell moved to Greenwich Village to seek their fortune. Both were employed by Kennedy Galleries, etching plates for the production of prints. During this time, Davis also continued painting watercolors that he sold to a dealer on Park Street in Boston. Many of his sketches were rendered into etchings and sold through Fisher Adler and Schwartz, and H. Wunderlich, as well as other publishers. According to David Little, a Concord resident, one of the founders of the Concord Art Association, Arthur Davis never allowed any of his works to become etchings 
unless he personally etched the plates and pulled the print. You will notice on many of the etchings in the lower right hand apron underneath the image, there is Arthur Davis's signature. That tells you as the viewer that he was responsible for creating that specific print. During the late 1880s and 1890s, Davis exhibited his paintings at the Boston Art Club, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. He was represented at the American Watercolor Society exhibit at the National Academy of Design in 1888. Arthur Davis only produced etchings when he was working in New York. He worked for publishers who had the presses required to print etchings. He did not have access to that equipment in the Boston area. Therefore, all of his etchings date from the 1890s. You will notice that some of these etchings are printed on silk. In the 1890s, etchings on silk were very popular because they enlivened the image and made the pieces more attractive. At some point during the 1890s, Arthur became engaged to a young woman who was teaching school. Her aunt, who was retiring from teaching, invited the young lady to accompany her on a trip to Europe. Arthur and his fiance agreed to postpone their marriage until she returned. Sadly, she ca caught typhoid fever in Rome and she died. His, her death profoundly affected him. He stopped painting his beautiful watercolors. He never married and when his parents' health declined, he returned to Acton to care for them. Living in Acton, he continued his habit of sketching daily, walking, riding his bike all over the Neshoba Valley with his sketchbook in his pocket. 21 of his sketchbooks have been located and are in the collections of the Acton Historical Society, the Ironwork Farm, and the library. When indexing the sketchbooks, I was surprised to see as many or fi as five or six detailed sketches, all with the same date. It didn't seem possible to me that he could have finished that many detailed sketches in a single day. I suspect he made one major trip a year, uh, excuse me, one major trip a week, and then spent the intervening week finishing up the sketches in his studio. Some of his sketches include notes about the clouds or the color of the sky, notations as to locations. These sketchbooks are visual records of how Acton and some of the surrounding towns appeared in the early 1900s. And a note about his studio. When I interviewed Caroline Livermore Crow several years ago, she told me about Arthur's home. She grew up on Main Street, three houses away from him, and occasionally would drop off extra vegetables and eggs from her family's farm. His studio was primarily his kitchen. She described jars of turpentine and open paint scattered all over the kitchen. And it was a working studio and also a kitchen. In 1902, Arthur Davis became the town librarian, a position he held until 1944. He also served as library trustee during the 1930s and 40s. During that time, he also sold some of his work, primarily small oils, from the library. Copies of the sketchbooks owned by the library and the Historical Society are available to view. You can check at the reference desk upstairs. There are albums of photographs of Davis works in private collections also available at the reference desk as well as the transcripts of interviews with David Little, Carolyn Kroll, and Evelyn Knowlton. Arthur Davis told David Little that he didn't want his work to be forgotten. That was his greatest fear. I think he'd be very pleased with this exhibit. Mm -hmm.